Hello, um, welcome to uh, the Whitechapel Gallery um, and Verso uh, special event uh, to celebrate the launch of Burn It Down, uh, Feminist Manifestos for the Revolution with uh, Brianne Fars. Um, today we're joined by Brianne and Lola who are going to be uh, sharing their thoughts on their two books, um, one it, which is Burn It Down and the other which is um, uh, Lola's um, book um, Feminism Interrupted. So a huge thank you to both of you for being with us here today. So Brianna is joining us uh, live from the US, uh, which is really exciting. Um, so this event is part of a series that Whitechapel Gallery um, has co-conceived with Verso um, as part of their 50th anniversary celebrations. Um, the idea is that we want to be inviting key feminist writers and thinkers um, to be um, in a series of six events uh, that will be really trying to think about what feminist theories and feminist activisms um, can take us through to the future. We want to think about the future and how we can act um, and which uh, speakers uh, are joining us to make us um, really take a look at the feminist histories that can drive our... our uh, Jane, where'd you go? <laughs> I think we lost. Have we, we lost her? Lost Jane. So, okay, uh, I'm briefly going to share the running order for today's event. Um, we are first going to be uh, hearing a few readings. First, Lola will read uh, from her book, uh, and then Brianne will read um, from the introduction to Burn It Down. We've then all selected a manifesto each that we'd like to, to share, and this will be the basis for the conversation that we have, because this was initially going to be actually a reading group, something we can't really do um, now, but we, uh, we've tried to take the uh, ideas of a reading group into this kind of live moment. Um, so um, these readings will define the, the conversation that we have in the second half. Um, we'd love to have your engagement with that. So please use the comments box on the Verso YouTube page uh, to add in questions that we'll collect uh, and bring into the Q&A section of the event. Um, and before we start, I'd also like to mention that if you haven't had a chance yet to buy the books, um, we can offer a 50% discount on both Feminism Interrupted and Burn It Down. Um, so if you head to the Whitechapel Gallery event page for this event, you can see a special set of discount codes um, to buy either um, of those. So um, before I hand over to Lola, who's going to start with a reading from her book, um, I'm going to briefly uh, introduce the two speakers. So. Um, um, Lola Olufemi is a black feminist writer, organiser and researcher from London. Her work focuses on the uses of feminist imagination and its relationship with futurity. Um, she's the author of Feminism Interrupted, Disrupting Power, uh, published this year by Pluto Press. Um, and she's also a member of Bare Minimum, uh, an interdisciplinary anti-work arts collective. And Brianne Fars is Professor of Women and Gender Studies at Arizona State University, where she is also the founder um, and director of the Feminist Research on Gender and Sexuality Group. Um, and she is the author of many different books uh, on feminism and feminist theory um, and various feminists. So we've really got a fantastic um, uh, pair of uh, women to speak with us today uh, and kick off this series. So um, without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Lola uh, to start with the first reading. Thanks. So this is um, uh, from the uh, introduction of Feminism Interrupted. We all begin somewhere. A feminist understanding is not inherent. It is something that must be crafted. Theory does not only mean reading dense academic texts. Theory can be lived, held, shared. It is a breathing, changeable thing that can be infused in many political and artistic forms. Learning re requires the patience and empathy of those around you and an investment in the importance of radical education. This radical education comes in many forms. When feminism enters the mainstream, it does not automatically lose its meaning or its appeal. What matters is the way it is discussed and, and whether or not the discussion challenges or affirms the status quo. How often have articles about feminism in mainstream publications inspired revolt? We have to ask what comes next after identifying the problem. 
as a starting point, can we move mainstream conversations about period poverty beyond the clutches of feminine hygiene companies and towards the fundamental idea that we cannot tackle this problem without ending austerity? Can we link the public disclosures of trauma facilitated by Me Too to the fact that many victims and survivors cannot leave violent situations because of the lack of available social housing or domestic violence provision? Can we use intersectionality as it was intended, a meaningful framework that exposes a matrix of domination and seeks to improve vital women's services and not a vehicle for a laundry list of our identities? Feminist visions. Feminism provokes a kind of feeling, a reaction, repulsion in the eyes of its detractors, and rightfully so. There are men who have built their entire careers on deriding us, media outlets that gleefully malign the seriousness of the task at hand. In 2018, Spike magazine ran two articles with the following headlines, no, women aren't at risk from men, and not everything is a feminist issue. A great deal of recruitment of young men into fascism and incel communities relies heavily on disproving or finding the logical flaws in feminist ideology. Feminism is cancer is a common slogan. Feminism is a threat. It is also a call to action. How should we think about the world remains one of the most important, frustrating, joyful questions we have to answer because it requires a recognition that our lives, our fates, our successes and disappointments are all connected. When we do feminist work, we are doing the kind of work that changes the world for everybody. It is important to feel free, but it's more important to get free, socially, politically, economically, artistically. Here we see why the decisions we make early on about what kind of feminists we will be are so important. It is vital to correct the misinformation about what it means to be a feminist in theory and in practice. Imagine this, a world where the quality of your life is not determined by how much money you have. You do not have to sell your labor to survive. Labor is not tied to capitalism, profit or wage. Borders do not exist. We are free to move without consequence. The nuclear family does not exist. Children are raised collectively. Reproduction takes on new meanings. In this world, the way we carry out dull domestic labor is transformed and nobody is forced to rely on their partner economically to survive. The principles of transformative justice are used to rectify harm. Critical and comprehensive sex education exists for all from an early age. We are liberated from the gender binary strangling grip and the demands it places on our bodies. Sex work does not exist because work does not exist. Education and transport are free from cradle to grave. We are forced to reckon with and rectify histories of imperialism, colonial exploitation and warfare collectively. We have freedom to, not just freedom from. Specialist mental health services and community care are integral to our societies. There is no state as we know it. Nobody dies in suspicious circumstances at its hands. No person has to navigate sexism, racism, disabilism, or homophobia to survive. Detention centers do not exist. Prisons do not exist, nor do the police. The military and their weapons are disbanded across nations. Resources are reorganized to adequately address climate catastrophe. No person is without a home or loving community. We love one another without possession or exploitation or extraction. We all have enough to eat well due to redistribution of wealth and resource. We all have the means and the environment to make art if we so wish. All cultural gatekeepers are destroyed. Now imagine this vision not as utopian, but as something well within our reach. The vision I have presented has its limitations. There are gaps, contradictions, and things that have been omitted. But without the capacity to imagine in this way, feminism is purpose purposeless. Let us fight over a vision because our demands must spring from somewhere. This is the task handed down to us and we must approach it with the urgency it demands. We must rise to the challenge with a revolutionary and collective sense of determination, knowing that if we do not see this world, someone else will. Oh, you're on, you're muted, Jane. Okay, so we're gonna, <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Lola. Um, <laughs> so we're now going to hear uh, from Brianne, uh, another excerpt from from your book, and then we'll get on to reading our manifestos. Um, thanks. Okay, so I'm going to read from the introduction to burn it down. Life in this society being at best an utter bore, and no aspect of society being at all relevant to women. There remains to civic-minded, responsible, thrill-seeking females 
only to overthrow the government, eliminate the money system, institute complete automation, and destroy the male sex. So begins Valerie Solanus' 1967 Scum Manifesto with one of the great all-time declarations of war against the pat patriarchal status quo. Solanus imagined not only an entirely new world, where men no longer defined great art, money, government, and culture, but also one populated by thrill-seeking females, dominant, secure, self-confident, nasty, violent, selfish, independent, proud, thrill-seeking, freewheeling, arrogant females who consider themselves fit to rule the universe, who have freewheeled to the limits of this society and are ready to wheel on for something far beyond what it has to offer. She wrote the manifesto for those in the gutter, which she called whores, dykes, criminals, and homicidal maniacs, wholly refusing to pander to nice, passive, accepting, cultivated, polite, dignified, subdued, dependent, scared, mindless, insecure, approval-seeking daddy's girls. <clears throat> Feminist manifestos exploded onto the scene from 1967 to 1971, a period marked by rampant sexism, emerging feminist resistance, consciousness raising, and collective organizing. Building on the momentum of the civil rights movement, the feminist revolts of the late 1960s paved the way for decades of feminist activism that followed. The validation of women's anger in the late 1960s, a cultural zeitgeist moment that recognized women as finally fed up and truly enraged, made it possible for women to push back against the cultural pressures for politeness and respectability. Instead, they fumed and ranted, scuffled and shouted, locked, armed, locked arms and marched. The sort of feminism found in early manifestos featured a starkly different brand of feminism from the more likable, friendly and benign one we have come to know today in institutions like education, government and corporate leadership. Second wave feminist manifestos honored a sweaty, frothing, high stakes feminist anger that swept through the writing. Their words burn and simmer even today giving them an unexpected freshness. In many ways, I assembled this book not to entertain or to amuse, but because we need this kind of work in our lives. Feminist manifestos are a necessity in times of great social stress. How else are we to make sense of our own anger, our sense of confusion and implosion, our imminent feelings of doom and stifled possibilities? The urgency of manifestos, that clear sense that they sit right on the cutting edge, leaves a palpable feeling that the ink has yet to dry, that we are, as Julian Hanna writes, on the bleeding edge of things. Regardless of when they were written, manifestos pulsate with newness and freshness. They pry open the eyes we would rather shut, forcing us to reckon with the scummy, dirty, awful truths that we would rather not face. And if ever there was a time for a collection of feminist manifestos, if ever it felt necessary to compile documents that celebrate women's rage, now is that time. Thank you. Um, so, uh, loads to talk about already within those, but I'm, we're going to add some more things to <laughs> consider <laughs> by uh, each choosing a manifesto. So, um, Lola is going first. And maybe if you just want to briefly introduce like the, the collective that wrote the manifesto uh, or, or the person that wrote it before the reading, that would help to contextualise a bit. Um, so, I'm going to read from what I think is a very uh, classic um, manifesto, um, the Kumbahi River Collective Statement, which was written in 1977 by the Kumbahi River Collective, which, who were um, a socialist, feminist, lesbian collective based in Detroit. Um, and I'm just going to read a couple of um, paragraphs. I think what I love so much about this manifesto is how it clearly outlines um, the political principles of black feminists um, at that specific moment and gives us a really clear sense of the methodologies that they were using to kind of analyze um, the world around them. We realized that the liberation of all oppressed people necessitates the, the destruction of the political economic systems of capitalism and imperialism as well as patriarchy. We are socialists because we believe that the work must be organized for the collective benefit of those that do the work and create the products and not for the profit of the bosses. Material resources must be equally distributed among those who create these resources. We are not convinced, however, that a socialist revolution that is not also feminist and anti-racist will guarantee our liberation. 
we have arrived at the necessity for developing an understanding of class relationships that take into account the specific class position of black women who are generally marginal in the labor force. While at this particular time, some of us are temporarily viewed as doubly desirable tokens at white collar and professional levels. We need to articulate the real class situation of persons who are not merely raceless, sexless workers, but for whom racial and sexual oppression are significant determinants in their working and economic lives. Although we are in essential agreement with Marx's theory as it applied to the very specific economic relationships he analyzed, we know that this analysis must be extended further in order for us to understand our specific economic situation as black women a political contribution which we feel we have already made is the expansion of the feminist principle that the personal is political. In our consciousness raising sessions, for example, we have in many ways gone beyond white women's revelations because we are dealing with the implications of race and class as well as sex. Even our black women's style of talking, testifying in black language about what we have experienced has a resonance that is both cultural and political. We have spent a great deal of energy delving into the cultural and exper experiential nature of our oppression out of necessity, because none of these uh, matters have ever been looked at before. No one before has ever examined the multi-layered texture of black women's lives. Okay, thank you, um, Brianne. I'm going to read the first selection from the book, and this is one of my favorites. Um, it's written by an American artist, Zoe Leonard, and this was in response to the 1992 presidential campaign where the poet Eileen Miles um, ran for president against George W. Bush, or George H. W. Bush. Um, so I want to just read, and again, we're, I'm also, of course, thinking about the crazy context of American politics and our upcoming election as well. So this is a bit of a homage to that. It's called I Want a President, again, written in 1992. I want a dyke for president. I want a person with AIDS for president. And I want a fag for vice president. And I want someone with no health insurance. And I want someone who grew up in a place where the earth is so saturated with toxic waste that they didn't have a choice about getting leukemia. I want a president who had an abortion at 16. And I want a candidate who isn't the lesser of two evils. And I want a president who lost their last lover to AIDS, who still sees that in their eyes every time they lay down to rest, who held their lover in their arms and knew they were dying. I want a president with no air conditioning, a president who has stood on the line at the clinic, at the DMV, at the welfare office, and has been unemployed and laid off and sexually harassed and gay bashed and deported. I want someone who has spent the night in tombs and had a cross burned on their lawn and survived rape. I want someone who has been in love and been hurt, who respects sex, who has made mistakes and learned from them. I want a black woman for president. I want someone with bad teeth, someone who has eaten nasty hospital food, someone who cross dresses and has done drugs and has been in therapy. I want someone who has committed civil disobedience. And I want to know why this isn't possible. I want to know why we started learning somewhere down the line that a president is always a clown, always a John and never a hooker always a boss and never a worker, always a liar, always a thief and never caught. You're muted. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I'm going to read the last one before we kind of move on into some questions. Um, I've selected, uh, it's a manifesto that I didn't, uh, I, I was familiar with, with um, both uh, of the ones you read, but this is one that was new to me from the book. Um, and it's by a collective called Havoc, um, the Horizontal Alliance of Very Organised Queers. Um, and they are um, a collective that formed in 2007 um, as a contingent to the US-Mexico No Borders Camp. Um, in Colectio Mexicali, and they are a collective of queer people organizing together in the San Francisco Bay Area to resist the violence created by the border, both in the Bay Area and in the borderlands. Um, and so I will read a section from their, uh, their manifesto. Um, how, uh, AKA Fabulosity. 
As we come together to organise around the demands we lay out in this document, we also want to keep in mind the culture we create with one another. Why? Because the same forces that make borders, racism and militarism have seeped into our relationships, our communities and ourselves. It's up to us to define, build and practice how we will treat each other and work together. We've heard some people call this praxis, putting our ideas into action. But we want to suggest another word for how we try to translate our queer perspectives on the oppressive forces around us into empowering action. Fabulosity. Fabulosity means that we will strive for open and inclusive language and culture. We will try to recognise each of our different and overlapping experiences. We have a lot to learn from and offer one another, even knowing that we won't always agree. Fabulosity means that we will also try to be open with one another, to new people and ideas, and we will constantly try and expand or deepen our base of ideas, skills and energy. We respect and we will use a diversity of tactics to achieve our goals. Fabulosity means that we will make time to do the work of building ways of being with one another that do not replicate the hierarchies that marginalise us in the first place. We believe that we can build coalitions and movements without relying on non-profits and professional activism. We want to create and maintain liberating and borderless spaces within which to meet and do work. Fabulosity means that we will work together not just to meet uh, specific demands, but also to build a movement and a community. This means that we will consider the sustainability of our projects, trying to find a balance between our immediate goals and needs and our longer term vision or collective health. And it means that the community we make isn't confined to meetings and actions, we like to eat together, play together, and spend unstructured time with one another. Fabulosity means that we will ask for what we want, not just what we think we can get. We know that the compromise is part of working in coalition, but we will strive to keep in mind our larger vision of what kind of world we ultimately want to see. We know this is hard, we will probably mess it up sometimes, but we will do our best. And then I also just want to read another section of the same manifesto uh, because I feel that this part kind of summarises not just the ideas of how they want to work together, but um, some of the kind of concrete ideas that they put on the table that they demand through the manifesto as well. So it's called policing ourselves. We see a connection between the policing of people's genders and sexualities with the policing of borders and seek to build a world where everyone may assert their right to self-determination. We reject the regulation of ourselves and our relationships through socially created borders, such as those used to define traditional families, acceptable sex practices, ideal bodies and gender presentations, and love. We work to expand the definitions of family to include queer and other self-defined relationships. Rather than fight to extend marriage to queers, we strive to create free and inclusive communities where we do not place legal borders between coupled families and those who enjoy single, asexual or polyamorous lifestyles. We believe that freedom of movement, access to services and other benefits should be available to all of us, regardless of our, uh, our marital or immigration status. We believe in the right to access documentation, regardless of our federal immigration status, and documentation that reflects our self-identified genders or does not list our genders at all. Further, we seek to build a world where government does not hold the power to legitimise our identities through access to documentation, such as IDs, and that the government control over access to these documents no longer impacts our abilities to lead the lives we want to live. We support the dismantling of medical guidelines that are used, to, used as political borders to limit freedom of movement. Recent changes to medical requirements for immigration, including the lift of the HIV ban and of mandatory HPV and herpes vaccinations, are examples of steps in this direction. We believe that requirements such as these violate the health, sexual and reproductive rights of migrants. We want, to end, uh, we want an end to all medical screenings as a prerequisite for immigration, which are developed and enforced in sexist, homophobic, transphobic and racist ways. So that's it, that's the uh, sections from the Undoing Borders Havoc Manifesto, uh, which I found really uh, inspiring. Um, so, <laughs> Um, that is a lot of uh, different information, a lot of different manifestos and also uh, the sections from your books. Um, I would like to maybe kick us off with a question that relates to actually 
Um, specifically the manifesto that Lola read, but also a, a kind of broader set of questions that have to do with kind of what we can learn through these um, intergenerational, these, these histories and the way in which the intergenerational passing of knowledge um, can be something that we can think about how how that functions and how that can be kind of productive in a way. So, so when we read the Combahee uh, River Collection Statement now, um, it was written over 40 years ago and it's a very inspiring text, um, but it's also very, in some ways difficult to read and tragic because it's so clear how little has changed and there are many parts of it that you feel could have been written like yesterday, it's, it's, it's very fresh. Um, and so I guess one question is sort of what what lessons can we learn from these um, from the methodologies of uh, black feminists working at this time that kind of can inform how we work now, um, and, and particularly in this moment. And I think that this is something, Lola, you talk about quite a lot in your section of your book called Know Your History, um, with a quite specifically uh, in relation to kind of the black British feminist histories but it also is transatlantic and also global and you talk about the kind of um, sort of international um, approaches that were kind of drawn and, and developed during that time so um, it, it would be great to hear your thoughts on that kind of idea um, of the intergenerational passing of knowledge. Um, I think what I love so much um, like I said before about the Kambahi River collective um, statement is how clear it is in its intention and its purpose and also uh, I think like on the left in general or or just in certain uh, political spaces we have very reductive conversations about identity and the power of identity politics and I think what the what the statement does so clearly is show us how show us the kind of material basis of identity claims of the the claims that we make on the basis of identity in terms of our political demands um I think what neoliberalism has done obviously is is uh kind of usher in a very individualist stick turn in which people make um, claims on the basis of identity but don't link those claims to material conditions and I think what black uh, feminist methodologies have done so well is to show us is to ex um, expand um, uh, the kind of scope uh, of categories that we use in order to make political demands so ideas of the worker idea uh, ideas of the working class and to show us how those categories and those frames are also inflected and lived through these uh, modalities that we call identity. So they're lived through race, they're lived through gender, so that it kind of becomes impossible to talk about the worker without paying attention to the kind of multi-layered experiences that workers will have um, uh, on the basis of who they are and how they are situated by this world. Um, uh, it, yeah, in terms of like the working class or how they have been um, how their bodies have been named in certain ways um, and how those uh, how that naming shapes their experiences of class or shapes their experiences of exploitation and so I think what the the collective um, what the statement does really well is narrow in on this idea of the black woman worker and how this vantage point gives us an incredible um, kind of scope and incredible position to begin to make demands from because it is fully uh, inclusive seems like the wrong word but it, it, it is fully intent um, attentive to all of the uh, uh, material conditions that affect our lives or all of the things that will you know essentially uh, that mark us as people who are being exploited in the world and I guess in terms of um, uh, the legacies that we can draw just in general. I think what's really interesting in reading some of these manifestos um, is recognizing you know, that a lot of them are contradictory in terms of when you compare them um, to each other, but that a lot of them kind of, um, they come out of grassroots formations, right? They come out of these formations that are, are have committed themselves to working um, against and beyond the state simultaneously and who refuse to kind of be subsumed by electoral politics or subsumed by institutions as the main markers of their freedom. And so from the ground, they're making these demands and building community where they are and properly kind of, I think, giving us a real landscape of what it is they're facing before um, they go out to tackle it in any number of ways. And for me, that, that is strategy. That's what strategy is, naming your enemy, naming and knowing your condition before you're able to, um, to oppose it. Right, and I mean, I think also in this book, 
there's really a sense that we're supposed to be understanding solidarities that aren't just in the in the current time and place, right? That something about, you know, the Kambahi River Collective, I I try not to see it as depressing that there has that, that what they wanted wasn't accomplished because in some ways they are supposed to be, you know, this book in some ways is that, right? You're sort of looking backwards to see that, you know, solidarity doesn't just exist in your current time and place. It's also, you know, geni- there's like a geneal genealogical pattern of it, right? That like we we use this work again and again and it becomes fresh again in moments that we need it. And this one we need right now, right? And there's many of them that sort of fall into the background and that we'll need in the future and many that we need right now. And the Kambahi River, River Collective Statement is one that we need right now for that. And I, I feel like, you know, I think Lola's absolutely right that there's an impoverishment in some ways of how feminism imagines. Maybe that's like, I think, I think Lola, that's one of the great contributions of your book and I love it so much for that because you're really trying to point out that it's not really even about one tactic or one um, goal or one, you know, one aim. It's really about an impoverishment of imagination that's happened with feminism. And that if we don't address that, if we don't start thinking in huge sweeping revolutionary terms, we're in deep trouble, right? And like, this is that moment where you see those divides start to happen, right? That like, you know, you know, are we going to be content with, police wearing body cams or are we going to try to go after the entire nature of policing itself to try to reimagine it and this is a moment where there's a breaking open of the world to do that kind of work and I feel like um you know when I'm when I reflect on the Kambahi River Collective as well you know they were doing that work in a moment that the world was broken open then right and we're and so we're back in a moment where We've broken open, you know, what we understand as normal or true and all these sort of things. And we need to use their work, I think, you know, it's sort of in solidarity with the work we're doing now. Um, you know, and, and that's true for a lot of these manifestos, like the ACT UP manifesto suddenly seems completely relevant and timely again, right? And this was written in the early days of days of AIDS activism, and we suddenly see this, like, resurgence of it. So I don't, I don't find that the, the manifestos that weren't fully realized um, feels sort of like it doesn't make me feel like blue or depressed, I guess, because I feel like they're, they're, they're a toolkit that we like turn to again. Um, you know, and the ACT UP activists, right, are saying in the early 80s, like, this is a matter of survival. If we do not have a radical presence in public health, we're, we're going to die from that. And we see that that's absolutely true. And right now we're in another moment where, you know, we have to we have to radicalize the way that we think about public health and safety and and well-being, right? And if we don't, then then people will die. So I think, um, you know, these genealogies really are important. And I think, you know, I mean, it's like p- things always seem impossible until they're not, right? If you look at apartheid politics, the Berlin Wall, I mean, every, you know, there's so many examples of things where people didn't believe that radical change was possible and then it was, right? So um, I don't I don't want us to, to look at these manifestos and feel a sense of loss or mourning. I actually think the opposite is true. And um, I want to pick up on um, on what you were saying, kind of it is part of your, both of your kind of responses to that, which is this idea of thinking about the manifesto as a creative act in itself, um, like the way in which the, even just the writing of it, the coming together and writing of it in some cases um, is actually, this kind of uh, it kind of gives birth to a, a sense of reality that these things can be real and I think you know Lola's introduction that she read um, we can really in a way think of that you talk about it as this like visionary piece but it's also it is a manifesto in a way you're kind of describing a world that you want to see exist and you say this isn't let's think about this not as a utopia let's think about this as something that is real and then the, the rest of the book goes on to explain how that may be possible mm. um, and so is this one of the things that the manifesto can do, you know, demand that another world is possible with a sort of confidence? Um, and, and yeah, I'd like to hear your re- sort of thoughts on that. And also maybe are there other manifestos in the in the collection that you think kind of are really truly transformative or have proved themselves to be transformative in this way? Mm-hmm. Um, I think, yeah, I think there, there's a way that so often things that get named utopian really what we're saying, we, we kind of relegate them to the realm of the not possible. And 
when thinking about the imagination, I think about the imagination as this like site of possibility that brings that which does not yet exist into being, right? And I think that that's what the manifesto does as a cultural product. It's imbued with the imagination in that way. And so, and, and it, the very fact of it, um, uh, brings that which does uh, not yet exist into being. I think what feminist methodologies are really good at and what feminism as, as a political practice is really good at is not getting lost in, in kind of linear understandings of progress, right? We, we've done away with the idea that progress is one march forward. It, it's kind of chaotic. It can we've seen how it can happen um, at different registers, at different times, in different locations. And so it's not so much an idea of tracing we were here then and now we are in a different place it's more about thinking okay it, in our kind of local and in our global orientations how can we how do we usher in new futures right and how do we begin to enact the future now and i think what's really great about again about the manifesto as a cultural product is that it's a space where you might be able to think beyond the limits placed on your body at any given time and we see the power of he hegemonic forces or he hegemonic structures um we see we see the ways that they operate when we're not we don't even grant ourselves the permission to um imagine things that don't seem possible or things or we say oh you know there's no point in committing these ideas or or these structures or whatever or these visions to paper because they'll never come to fruition and that for me is a clear example of the things that are sitting on our imaginations at any given time that make it easier to um uh be complicit in or to be okay with the world as it is and i, I think what the the manifesto does is is maybe um enable us to to uh, reject this idea of becoming propagandists for the world in its current form right to say like this is this is not enough for us and and we'll always be hungry for more mm -hmm. yeah and i mean manifestos understand that you know systems are fragile right and they and on some level it's really a sort of you know an act of faith and an act of destruction all at once right and i mean remember the the thing that makes a manifesto a manifesto i mean we could i'm sure debate this i guess but is this sense of being impatient too right so there's it's highly emotional and highly impatient and very very angry typically and those things i think we we often are just too um inclined to shy away from you know like Manifestos, I think, have a very unique way of being creative and of inventing worlds because of those that combination of things. They're really, it's very, very, very much against the liberal politics of be patient, wait and see, change comes slowly. It just has no tolerance for that. It's it's all about the sort of um, the, the radical sort of breaking through of we need deep systemic change. We need it now. I'm not going to wait. I'm not going to, you know, just sort of inch along and so in that way it's trying to sort of like again like crack through like parts of the future i think as well um and i mean there there's also a real sense that manifestos are written not in rarefied language they're not citing people all the time they they really are trying to break through also the sense the relationship between audience and writer where you know you're you don't have to credential yourself to write a manifesto and that's one thing i love about it so much too is it's a genre that's so accessible and so available to everyone because on some level it really does access people's inherent like you know quest for freedom i guess right or the the sense of how do we invent new solidarities and freedoms and imaginations about the future and we don't and you don't need to be um you know credentialed to do that and you don't have to cite other people and it's sort of it's all about just like i'm going to lay out this world vision um, and i think that's really interesting right to switch around this notion of, of audience and writer and how we kind of think about, um, well, what language feels like it can like sort of pierce through to the widest possible audience. Sometimes reading manifestos is just an incredibly emotional experience reading them, right? Where you feel uh, sometimes overwhelmed, you, you can feel like the sort of contagious nature of their anger. You feel like inspired, you can feel repulsed even sometimes. I mean, it. I love writing that produces in us a sense of like immediate almost visceral reaction to it and so much writing doesn't do that that it feels like when you do read writing that does that you it's almost like a I don't know like you're it's like someone's throwing water in your face or punching you in the face sometimes maybe but it's definitely a wake-up call right where you are suddenly aware of the power of words and the way that they 
work so differently when, when the audience is not, you know, a, an incredibly like limited, tiny niche slice of the world, but instead, you know, trying to, to reach the masses. Um, and I think it does, it does point to some necessity too of us to think differently about the ways that language travels, the ways that creative work moves. I mean, I love manifestos also because they're, they really don't have any regard for being historicized. I mean, that's ironic given that, you know, this book is like trying to sort of, you know, make a space for them to still exist as a, as a, maybe a historical document, but also a living, breathing document now. Um, but there, you know, it's all about, I want the change now and I, and I'm not going to wait for it. And I'm not going to be told that it's impossible. Um, so Lola, I think you might be a manifesto writer too. So <laughs> um, <laughs> I, think I, I discovered just, that. I just wanted to add to that as well, that I, I don't think that it's a, um, for me, like, I don't think it's a coincidence that like the, the manifestos under the kind of like black and indigenous like portion of the book, um, that those manifestos are critical of the visions that have been put forward by other kinds of feminists or other you know other kind of arenas of feminism because I think it's really what what this book what reading this book showed me is that like we might all you know call ourselves feminists of some degree but we're not all invested in the same political project and that at any given time there are loads of there are there are loads of ways in which our visions are contradicting and I, I feel like there's something specific about being placed on the periphery of the feminist movement etc as we've seen the way that black feminist movements have been done um, have been placed in that way um kind of across uh continents like there's something that for, uh, about that vantage point that makes you, I think, veer towards abolition versus reform or or to look beyond like mm. the scope of just rights or to look beyond the scope of um, we're, we're seeking minor tweaks in structural systems. Um, and, and that uh, often I don't think that that is acknowledged enough when we're talking about visions for the future. And I think Linda LaRue talks about this um, great and um, in, in an excellent way in her manifesto where she basically says like, I don't have anything in common with white feminists whose concerns were like dishpan hands. I had to deal with almost dying. And th that means that like the idea that we share some kind of political project Project, it, it makes it, it hard for me to believe. And I found that incredibly striking because it, it gives a voice to a specific kind of frustration when we think of feminism as a homogenous or unifying kind of principle, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think feminism deals enough with its sort of jagged edges and margins and all that as well, too. And I think when we start you know, the, the neoliberal, as you as you like to critique as well, the neoliberal kind of mainstream, you know, in, inclusivity at all costs and, you know, shaves down all of these like jagged edges. So you you erase voices from the margin, you erase voices that are overly angry or let's say hostile or maybe even violent. You erase people who are basically turning towards the, you know, the sort of mainstream feminism and like trying to obliterate some of its claims, you you erase so many, so many, so many voices. And I think, you know, we have an obligation, I think, as contemporary feminists to like, absolutely not shave off the edges and the margins of what feminism is and the voices that are on those margins. And that includes also, you know, if we look at class based struggles, too, in terms of, you know, again, how do we sort of there's there's some manifestos in here, I really love in regard to that, where people are addressing poor women specifically, and how do we sort of think about the class struggle as at the core of feminism too, which also gets erased often by, um, you know, by academic feminism, by the sort of girl power feminism, by the, you know, capitalistic sort of feminism. So I, I do think, you know, if we continue to kind of move forward with new visions of feminism, it's not about erasing that complexity. And we don't, I don't want there to be um, for me personally, either like a sort of overemphasis that we have to have a completely shared understanding of what feminism is. I think we want messiness, we want contradiction, um, we want all of the stuff that doesn't necessarily fit neatly together to be in conversation at all times, right? I mean, that's what makes feminism an exciting and like, you know, I think very productive space is to imagine, again, different allyship, different solidarities, but not to erase the sort of things that you know, create deep tensions within it. And I, I do think that's an impulse that happens way too often in feminism as well, that it's painful to have the sort of, you know, the fracturing of, of that space or the, um, 
I don't know, the sort of, you know, the, the marginal sort of edges, like reflecting back into the center and saying the center has to change, you know, that's the only way that the center does change though. So we, we can't get rid of that. I think it's crucial. Mm -hmm. and I, th this is um, in a lot of ways things that I wanted to bring up by actually staging the series uh, with Verso and actually to say look I, I think that Verso published some really fantastic writers who who have um, really led the way and are thinking about these different kind of specific um, types of feminism and that the feminisms that define kind of contemporary feminism and that this is that to have a series that could go kind of um, and take a, a look at different elements of it and I, I like the way you talk about kind of jagged edges because I think this is really essential I think too often in um, in kind of especially in the contemporary art sphere like this idea of like feminism as one thing or the waves as one type of thing that are naturally the erasure of so many um, practices and, and ways of approaching things and work um, happens so much so it's really refreshing I think this, this conversation um, and uh, there's something that I wanted to bring up that for me comes out of what we were describing in a way um, because you both talk about um, radicality in your texts uh, I use the word radical in different ways um, and we know that this is a very contentious uh, uh, like word effectively in feminism it's, it's, a, it's a word that's associated with a type of feminism that is being rejected um, and not that I necessarily want to get into a, a kind of full conversation around, around that but I would like to think about what radicality means to you and um, how you think about its relationship to contemporary feminisms actually um, and is it something that can we maybe need to think about being reclaimed um, or, or change the way in which we kind of use it um, or not so yes I'm interested in, in that for both of you. Um, I, yeah I think it's a, a really complicated one I think when I was writing this um, when I was writing Feminism Interrupted sometimes I found it hard to kind of um, signal what kind of feminism I was harking to when I was uh, trying to describe a feminism that opposes neoliberalism that opposes liberal visions for the world right you can say radical feminism but like you said that brings up a, a lot of um, kind of conflicting ideas in people's heads um, or and and I think uh, in some parts of the book I use a kind of critical feminism and I think in ways it's not so important that there is you know one singular word that is a marker of what we mean um, but I, I guess my my kind of um, approach to radicality or, or, or my understanding of what it means to be radical I think is it is closely connected to the idea of the abolition of the tenets of this world in in favor of new ones or in favor of um uh yeah in favor of uh worlds that we seek to build essentially and for me what it means to be radical is is to have that commitment to to abolition to to loosen um your attachments to um uh the markers of this world the markers of your own body the markers of the self institutions um electoral systems etc um but i think it's also about remaining critical of um feminism as a discourse and understanding its many kind of genealogies and histories and the rich ways in which um there has always been tension at the core of the feminist project i think for me um being radical is also linked to this idea of flexibility in, in thinking, the idea that it's okay to, to change your mind, it's okay to, to be presented with new information that helps you shift your worldview um, uh, towards a, a world that is uh, for the benefit of all people. Um, and I think often, um, yeah, there is this tendency I guess to shy away from what it means to be radical only because of, you know, the, the associations that it calls up in its head. But when I think of radicality, I, uh, radicality, for example, I think of like the black radical tradition. I think of people who were deeply committed to um, uh, enacting movements, enacting ways of being, um, enacting struggles that were about not only autonomy, um, but were also about those visions that we kind of spoke about at the beginning, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, it's, I think it's crucial to remember that, you know, radical does not mean extreme. It doesn't mean, you know, just something that's, that's more intense. It does, that's not really what it means. It means going to the root of something to understand its nature and then changing something at the root. And I think that meaning has gotten really, like, badly distorted, I think, you know, in large part because 
we've now done this weird thing where we talk about the radical left and the radical right. I mean, the ra a radical right is really a contradiction in terms and what, and something we should stop saying, at least by my account, um, that there is no radical right. The right is not all that interested in, you know, deep systemic, you know, justice-based change. So in that sense, you know, there could be a far right, but not a radical right. A rad radical means going to the root, understanding its nature, trying to go deeper, understanding its nature, trying to go deeper, understanding its nature, and then working to change those things from as far down in the root structure as possible, which also leads again to like, when you, when you think in that way, you can also imagine it's an, it's a natural sort of coming together then of all sorts of different identities and people's lives and, you know, like geographies and all that too, because if we're thinking in more radical ways, that's also a way that we start to see linkages and connections between people that we may otherwise miss if we're thinking in a more superficial way. I want to read this tiny quote that I love by the industrial workers of the world or the Wobblies. They said, it is well to note that from radicalism has flowed all that makes life better today than yesterday. It is now, as in the past, the only force capable of leading the world out of its night of hunger, hatred, and fear. Humanity advances over a path blazed by radicals and stained with their blood. So long as there is injustice, there will be radicals. The name itself is the proudest title of free men and women. And I love that quote too, because I think in some ways, this denigration of radicalism is perhaps one of the most personally painful things that I see happen, where it, it starts to be treated as a sort of dirty word or something that we should be avoiding. Um, you know, I mean, the, the kind of the difference between working at a level where you're thinking about radical systemic change versus a within system, you know, let's try to like improve the, the system, but uphold the, the rightness of the system is just so profoundly different that it feels almost painful to imagine us only working in these liberal ways, right? These kind of within system, like we just need to elect more women leaders. We just need to, you know, again, like it's the body cam solution to policing, right? And right now, maybe that's so vivid to us versus like rethinking policing altogether. It's, you know, all the ways in which when we start to think about like, like the nature of reproductive rights in a more radical way, we really understand like that bodily autonomy has been something taken from people for, for hundreds of years, right? And like the ways that bodily autonomy connects with all sorts of other, you know, issues of labor and class and race and all these other things, you know, radical visions help us to really look at that and understand that differently. Um, and again, that's why I love manifestos as well, because they are so, I think, almost instantly eager to think in those ways or, um, you know, to sort of overreach on purpose, right? The, the whole point is to overreach, is to imagine a new world that you or your collective may be created together. Um, so, so yeah, I think we, we have to reclaim radicalism um, from the way it's been sort of, you know, degraded and misused, I think, and, and really start to think in those ways and, and call ourselves this, this label even. I think it's crucial. Lola, that's why, I, you know, thank you for your work to help do that because, there's, there's not actually like a ton of people out there doing that kind of work. And so I think, you know, that it feels exciting when you come across someone who's shamelessly, militantly radical in their work and just, just, you know, really owning the possibility of that. And it feels like, you know, that's something that the more that we can sort of, you know, sniff that out and find it and be a part of, you know, wherever we sort of sense that happening and these, these little epicenters of radical work, the better. So anyway. Um. I will take a couple of questions we've got in the comments, actually. Um, but before I do, do either of you have questions for each other that we haven't, things that we haven't covered that you wanted to take this opportunity to ask? I think I, um, I think I kind of wanted to ask um, Brianne what what the criteria was for choosing these manifestos or if there was one right because when I think what you said before about historicizing things is incredibly important because when you create a collection in ways you're you're legitimizing what's in it you're saying that these are the, these are the manifestos that are worth kind of looking at and listening to so what does it mean then to be an authority um on on you know what manifestos should guide us in this moment in the form of this book if that if that makes sense Oh, I know. I mean, that's the painful part, right? Is like 
the weird sort of, you know, sorting of which ones are feminist manifestos versus just, you know, just manifestos that aren't necessarily distinctly feminist. We had, we made a lot of cuts actually kind of, you know, at the end of ones that didn't quite feel like they were coming from enough of a feminist tradition, you know, ones that were like, you know, environmentalist manifestos and other sorts of things. Um, and I think, you know, the, the process of making this book was really, it's kind of bizarre in some ways, right? Because I was trying to sort of think about different tension points or different bodies of work that we could read together. It was really important to me to sort of assemble the book into bodies of work. So, and then there's, and there's seven different sections. So there's, you know, queer trans, there's um, trashy punk, there's a, ha a whole section on feminist hackers. Um, the, the book ends with a, a section called witchy bitchy, which is looking at, you know, like these, these reclaiming of terms that often get lobbed at women um, in, a, in a sort of, you know, derogatory way and like how feminists have sort of reclaimed that. So there's different and, and you know, there's like a, an, an anti-capitalist um, anarchist section. So I'm trying to also I wasn't just thinking about including different individual manifestos, but also trying to establish these sort of miniature bodies of work that are meant to be read together and meant to have this sort of collective impact where when you read the whole section together, it has a different sort of meaning than simply reading the individual manifestos together. So, and I hope that that translates for readers. I, I really feel like reading, bot, like sort of, you know, these smaller bodies of work is very moving, at least to me. Um, and, and looking at the ways in which, you know, people are taking up different themes and so eloquently sort of building on each other's work or referring back to it. And like, you know, time sort of works differently then because you'll read a manifesto from last year and then you'll read a manifesto from the 19th century and somehow they're like, they're in conversation again. So that was also part of my thinking was, um, you know, it wasn't just, you know, certainly the criteria wasn't just, you know, manifestos I like, some of them I don't like, in fact, but, but a lot of them I like, obviously, but, um, but also trying to establish, you know, like what, and again, what is a feminist manifesto versus manifestos in general? You know, people usually only know manifestos through things like the communist manifesto, which is such a tragedy because the feminist manifesto has such a rich tradition that I think often has just been obscured, right? That we, again, I mean, just like your sort of critique that, the neoliberal feminist sort of liberal mainstreamy kind of version just has like completely eliminated almost every single voice that's in this collection for various reasons. Mm. Um, and so, I mean, some of the, some of the like subsections are organized around emotion. Like there's one that's just about anger and violence. So the kind of thinking about that and some are organized around identities and some are organized around again, like these labels. Mm. Um, so they're not, it's not totally consistent either, but I think, in that sense, like, you know, it helps to give more texture to the notion of what manifestos can be. Right. Some of them are very short. Some of them are very obvious manifestos. And some of them are a little bit more like, well, they don't call themselves manifestos, but I'm reading them as such. Just, I mean, and there's lots of ways in which, like, that's a kind of interesting conversation of itself. Like, who, you know, the gatekeeping around what is a manifesto or not. Yeah. Um, but I hope this is one of, you know, of many future collections of manifestos. I really really like having this book around me it's like the weirdest thing to say right because i but it's fun it's nice to have this work collected together and sort of turn to it especially during coronavirus period when there's just so many ways that we feel you know disempowered and sort of stripped of community and stripped of you know literally even physically seeing each other to also feel like you know like the, the people who who write manifestos are like a part of our um, not just our genealogies as feminists, but also like a part of our own like personal way of relating mm -hmm. to the world. So mm -hmm. I guess that's a weird long winded answer, but yeah. Um, well, we're starting to run out of time, but I, there is a question from um, from the comments box that I want to pose to you because I think it's an interesting one. Um, so this person uh, has asked that um, we always talk about writing the manifesto but in regard to imagination and vision what role do you think visual mediums have within feminist manifestos and i think that's interesting to go back to the idea of the visual and actually there are a couple of plates in the book mm. and there's sort of like um the Zeno feminist manifesto for example has a really interesting visual kind of um structure um i know it's one that both of you are interested in maybe you could talk a bit about this idea of like the visual medium in manifestos mm. Mm. yeah i think um 
I, I was, as you were talking, I was thinking about um, Laboria Kubonik's Xeno Manifesto and, and what is so great about reading that manifesto is, is, as the question asked, it takes seriously the role of visual mediums in making, um, in accompanying our demands. And I, I think it's really interesting in what um, form manifestos are found in, right? Because obviously there's a format in this book, but these manifestos were envisaged in different spaces on different pieces of paper in different ways. Some probably had photographs attached to them. Some had diaries and um, entries attached to them or were found like um, through archives. And so I think it, it, it's interesting how we not only um, preserve the manifesto and, and in what form we find it, but I think on the question of um, visual mediums, I think they have a huge role to play. And I, what I kind of love about the, the and I, I write about it, this in the book, um, coming to a kind of feminist uh, canon or an understanding is that feminism exists in, in this multi-disciplinary um, way, which is, incredibly generative right there that that theory isn't just about books theory is um kind of contained in the visual media that we consume in music in all of these in performance art um in all of these different uh, uh mediums that feminists have kind of wielded in order to make demands and to make claims and i think it's important to note that the manifesto is not only something that is written right it's, it's something that can be demanded with the body it's something that can be demanded um with um, the camera, I think of like the rich kind of history of um, uh, feminist cin cinema um, and, and the ways that uh, cinema, especially in kind of non-Western context in um, uh, thinking a lot about like African cinema, for example, um, or, or cinema from countries on the continent, um, the way that, that the visual medium in that way has helped to portray the urgency of demands that grassroots um, activists are making, or the ways that it's helped to, to reframe and retell histories of struggle and revolution that only some people see um, or, or are made aware of through text. And so I think the visual, what, what the visual offers is um, a sense of aliveness. It gives the, uh, the, the manifesto, it, I think it shows us its malleability as a form. And it shows us that, um, yeah, there isn't there isn't one um, set way that we we can um, uh, take in information, right? That 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 whatever comes to us in terms of our ideas, we should follow whichever medium best articulates um, that vision and that purpose. And sometimes that will mean completely abstract visual mediums, kind of accompanying the words and and helping to to I think portray an effective feeling um, that often isn't captured. Um, through literature or often can't be conveyed just by what is written down. Yeah, and I mean, maybe maybe what you're getting at too is that manifestos are sort of a way of thinking, right? And so in that sense, or lens, in that sense, visual mediums then play such an important role. And you're absolutely right. So many of these manifestos had, you know, were like one page, very like consciously crafted, beautiful, I think, funky, weird scribbly writing sort of you know documents that like even like the sort of the marginalia the the type of paper the color choice the everything matters in those and we tried to preserve the press was very generous about that like trying to preserve you know not just the the plate section in the center of um with some of the color ones but also just some of the original like handwritten or you know people are scribbling out scribbling out things or mimeographed copy so you can get a feel of what it felt like to distribute these, you know, in the, let's say in the seventies or something. Um, but there's, I mean, there's also a whole tradition, I think that we will have to kind of return to maybe of looking for, you know, where are like manifestos or manifesto ish things that were hidden plain and, you know, in plain sight that we didn't recognize as such thus far. I mean, I, I always feel like I'm stumbling upon that, um, when I was in Chicago, I, I came across this, uh, the, you know, of course they had this huge exhibit on, um, anti-apartheid posters. And there was this wonderful poster that I just can't get enough of that. Just, I'm like totally obsessed with now. And I put, I put it in the sort of, you know, very beginning of the book of the, the text of it, but it doesn't capture the sort of visually arresting quality of it, but it says, now you have touched the women, you have struck a rock you have dislodged a boulder, you will be crushed. This is so wonderful. And this is, you know, again, on anti-apartheid Women's Day, August 9th, 1956, that, you know, you go back now to that poster 
And I mean, if ever there's a sort of visual image of a manifesto-ish type thing, that's it, right? Or again, going back again to like, what does it mean to sort of think about, um, you know, the explicitly political nature of art and how do we how do we constantly keep an eye out for the ways in which in the art world things, you know, the art world is always first, isn't it? They're always the ones at the cutting edge, you know, making the future for us. And so in that sense too, they're, they're the perfect sort of, I think, um, you know, medium in which to experience manifestos or imagine manifesto language being born. And so much of the history of manifestos actually is in the connection to the history of art. And that's not an accident, right? That, you know, art is always trying to do what manifestos are doing too, which is imagine a future and look towards the future and, you know, give us not, not just imagery, but, you know, really try to use a sophisticated language to, to explain to us what's coming, you know, it's great in that way. So I think we, we just have to keep looking for, you know, where have all of these visual images that maybe haven't been interpreted as manifestos, how do we go back to them now and, and sort of see them differently or with fresh eyes? And that's maybe a task for everyone in the art world to be doing, to be, you know, really trying to fall in love again with political art and, you know, not losing sight of where it's been hiding. I think that's fantastic. That's a really good maybe place to end on because we are going to run out of time, although I'm sure we could have this conversation all day. Um, you know, obviously we are staging the series Whitechapel Gallery and, and Verso, and I think that these kind of political urgencies cannot be ignored and it is essential. And many artists are making work that are taking these uh, approaches and, and kind of trying to grapple with kind of um, feminist approaches. And that's, you know, many artists interested in things such as hydrofeminism, which is like a subversion, subsect of ecofeminism. You've got people who are interested in kind of trans feminism. You've got people who, you know, many artists working in social practice are like directly working from a, a strong lineage of um, feminist uh, community work and that, that is just an absolutely fundamental um, set of um, areas um, and I'm really that this uh, series is a way that we can we can start to like have some of those conversations um, in a really direct way so uh, I would like to say thank you so much to Lola and Brianne for joining us uh, this evening um, and for Brianne for your morning, of course, uh, coming <laughs> at us from Arizona. Um, I'd like to thank you to Verso, uh, who have um, uh, embarked on this with us and um, have been really fantastic partners um, to deliver this series of events. Um, and of course, to everyone who's been um, and been, um, been some really lovely comments uh, as we've been going. So um, I really appreciate that. Um, so for now we'll say uh goodbye and i uh, hope you, to see you all at the next event which is on the 23rd of july um with judith butler and amia so thank you thank you so much <laughs>